And see if it's streaming there. Amen. Don't use your freedom to indulge us. Don't use your freedom to do things that you're not supposed to. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. That means, see what that means, Lily? To be free and to serve one another? How can we serve one another? Oh, maybe you could help um, take out the trash. Or maybe you could pick up your toys. Or maybe you could help with the dishes. Are you allowed to do dishes yet? No. Amen. He gives us a freedom from sin. So we don't have to do bad things. So we can choose to do what Jesus wants us to do. So I'm going to ask if you are a veteran, if you will stand right now. And I'm going to let you guys look around and see how many people have stood up. So if you are a veteran, if you will stand. But that's a tough one because she's saying, "Be do good things for one another and their brother and sister." Yeah, that's why Lily was like, "Oh, I mean, look at him." I'm kidding, Lily. You can find out good things to do for your brother. I couldn't, but you can. Well, it is. Sharon said today's Memorial Day. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. Just want to, you know, any opportunity I can get to correct. Her? No, I'm kidding. That doesn't work out very well for me. But tomorrow's Memorial Day, and I hope you've had a good week. You, you look well. It's a little bit cooler here than it was last week. Yeah, yeah. I came, first thing I said is, where, where's the thermostat? Tell me where that is. And it's behind a locked door and, you know, down a dungeon and, you know, past the, the uh, chain guard room and all that. So, but I found it, so it should be... Uh, nicer this week and we've got a nursery across the way for the kids to go over and play in so Matthew if you want to go play okay there's toys anyway but it's good to see you all here and tomorrow is Memorial Day now I thought it would be obviously I, I mean as a veteran I'm 
I'm going to speak about Memorial Day, but it was difficult because I wanted to continue in our study of, of uh, the book of Acts because next week is Pentecost and I really just want to get there. But I held off. We're going to do Memorial Day because that is vitally important. I think probably more this year than in, uh, you know, I, I guess since the uh, 90s when we went to war with with Iraq and uh, you know it's uh, I think we're just thinking about it a lot more and the freedoms that we have in our country uh, so I wanted to go back to the beginning I wanted to define what a memorial is now the dictionary defines a memorial as something designed to preserve a memory or a person of a person or an event and then the Bible dictionary you know because we have to be spiritual so I looked at the Bible dictionary it basically says the same thing the word memorial uh, is defined as a, a remembrance a record or a reminder so this weekend as a nation we are remembering and are reminded of those men and women as as Sharon said in the children's sermon who who gave their lives who sacrificed and they did that from the founding of our country all the way to this present day um, on the the website on uh, lwchurchcc.com the prayer that I posted is a prayer about that service and that sacrifice from the beginning and someone sent me a Dennis Prager uh, video about Memorial Day that was powerful uh, so I think if you go, if you're on Facebook, if you go to my Facebook page, you'll have to wade through it because I put it on there because it was that good. Uh, it's important to us. So to memorialize this day and the sacrifice that was made. Now, Jesus even talks about that when he says, greater love hath no one than that they lay down their lives for their friends. And I've always been a bit uncomfortable with that for that one word that's in there, friends. I think if we're honest, everyone in this room would, would feel pretty easy about laying down your life for your family members, for your children, for your parents, uh, you know, for those that are in your family. But when you say you're going to lay down your life for your friends, that's a whole nother level of sacrifice, isn't it? But as we look at Memorial Day, isn't that exactly what every serviceman and woman has done? Not just those that paid the ultimate sacrifice, but those that fought like these men and women here that stood. And they were able to come back because it took a commitment, it took a sacrifice. You're being away from your life. You're stepping out of what your plans may have been for the rest of your life. And for a time, you're serving your fellow man, your country, your God. And that is a sacrifice at a whole nother level. And Jesus talked about that. Greater love hath no one than to lay down your life for your friends. If you looked at the, the app, I sent a picture. And, and I found that picture a couple years ago. And I think it pretty much sums up everything. I mean, when you look at it, it's, it's a mom, a wife, with her son. And he's, in a, he's a toddler, and he's in a little uh, Marine uniform. And they're sitting around the, the graveside of her husband, his daddy. I think it pretty much says it all. He laid his life down, certainly for his family, but also for his friends, for his country, for his God. So as I thought about this weekend, knowing that many of us served, uh, I think it's important that we look at the idea of where memorials come from. And beyond that, the need for memorials in our lives uh, that... Uh, and not just Memorial Day weekend. I'm talking about personal memorials in our lives. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're going to um, look at the significance of them in the Word of God, but also how they apply and how they are needed in our lives. Uh, if you have your Bibles, and I know you do, 
because every one of you have a phone. So you carry the word with you uh, and paper Bibles. I see that. I want you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapters 3, 4, and 5. No, we're not going to read all of them today. But there are scripture, there are verses throughout there that I want you to see. And I, I pray that this weekend, that, that you all take time to remember the sacrifices that were made, that, that allow us to be in this country, as Sharon talked about, where we can pray openly, where we can come and gather. Because there are countries where this isn't allowed, where we can speak our mind, uh, where we can uh, have, have the freedoms that we uh, celebrate. Now, I know it's Memorial Day weekend, but I want you to understand it's not just about eating food that we shouldn't eat, although I'm going to do that. Uh, and it's not just about getting together with friends and family, although we're going to do that, I'm sure, as well. Uh, it is about a whole lot more, and it needs to be a whole lot more than that, right? So let's go to Joshua. Here's the big picture, and, and really the bigger picture uh, of memorials. If you don't know what's happening in Joshua chapter 3, the, the nation of Israel has finally reached the promised land. Oh, well, for the second time. And they're right about to get into the promised land. You see, the first time when they went, uh, you'll remember that they sent 12 spies into the land to check it out. And we know that 12 went in, 12 came out, 10 had what some translations call an evil report, a bad report. There are giants in the, we can't do this. And then two, Joshua and Caleb came back and said, God said this was ours. They came back with a good report. And so God said, because of those, those bad reports, this generation, this faithless generation, has to pass away. They will not be allowed into the promised land. And that's exactly what's happened. So 40 years later, wandering in the wilderness, now they come up to the Jordan River, and they're about to pass into the promised land for the second time. When they get there, they have an obstacle. They look out and they stop at the Jordan River. Now remember, 40 years ago, when they left Egypt, they had an obstacle of water as well, a barrier of water. And God supernaturally parted the Red Sea, and they walked across on dry land. Here they are again at the end of the 40 years. It's interesting how God bookcases uh, the, the times, the epochs, that uh, epochs that we have in, uh, in the Bible. They're standing at another water obstacle. They have to somehow get across the Jordan River. Now, all the historical stuff that I've found about the Jordan River at this time when Israel is standing there says that it's about a mile across. I grew up in, in Iowa, uh, Dubuque, Iowa, right on the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River, where I grew up, was about a mile across. They had locks and dams and everything which made you know the water, they controlled the flow of water. Uh, but... I can, I can picture that because I did some very bad things as a kid. Um, we, we had something called a river fest days in my hometown. This is not part of this. This is just a freebie. Uh, and and uh, my friend and I were asked to, um, to portray Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. I mean, we're on the Mississippi River. Someone's got to do it. So uh, apparently I was a scrappy looking toe-headed. You know that term, toe-headed kid? I had white hair, I had blonde hair. So they, uh, they said, well, just, my dad was on the police force. They said, just let, uh, you know, uh, uh, Richard Ray's son find someone and do that. So they were going to, they wanted us to just be there at this little lay or a uh, little inlet on the side of the river and to play uh, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. But we made a raft, my friend and I did, a very shoddy, constructed raft and we floated down the Mississippi River. Our plan was to float down to where they wanted us to get off and and be Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. It didn't work out so well for us because uh, the river was a mile wide. We didn't think about you know being able to steer a raft. Anyway, so that's where that's just a freebie. You know, you know that I was not a juvenile delinquent, but I was pretty close. Uh, 
the Israelites are standing at the Jordan River. It's a mile across. It's flood stages. So not only is it a mile across, it's flowed outside its banks, but it's also a raging river. It's moving fast. Uh, and they have to somehow get across this river. So they're confronted with it. Uh, and this is a major obstacle. There are no boats. There, there are no bridges. There's no assistance to get them across the, uh, the land. Now, what are we talking about getting across the land? Two million men, women, and children. Yeah, you know, that's a lot of people. It's not just that. It's also 40 years in the wilderness. Their livestock, wagons, all of their stuff for a whole generation. They've been uh, nomads. Bedouins just kind of moving around in the wilderness. So all of that stuff has to get across the Jordan River as well. This is a monumental task. It's a big obstacle. And let me remind you what God said about the land across the Jordan River. That it's a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. Now, for those of you who are lactose intolerant, it might not be so great, but... Basically, in these days, a land flowing with milk and honey meant health and prosperity. They would have everything that they needed in this land across the river. It, it should remind us of another New Testament text. Uh, 3 John 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 2 says, uh, says this, I pray above all things that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. It's a, it's a foreshadowing. It's a reference to the land that we inherit in heaven. Health and prosperity in heaven. And these people are looking across the Jordan River with the promise of God that there will be milk and honey, health and prosperity, everything that they need. So the kingdom of God is also a place where those things happen. When you dwell in it, when you follow the rules, when the, the, the word, uh, uh, you follow the word, and you're, uh, as we prayed earlier uh, in the back room, when you're a doer of the word and not just a hearer of it, when you live inside that kingdom, it promotes health and prosperity in your soul. That is a good thing. So our kingdom is very similar to the land that they are standing at the entrance to, but they have to pass through the water. A, a little, another side note. Have you ever noticed the importance that the Word of God puts on passing through the water? They, they did it coming out of Egypt. They're doing it going into the promised land. Jesus talks about it and does it. We are commanded to do it, not because it saves us passing through the water, but because it's an outward symbol of the change of what did change us. The Holy Spirit comes in and baptizes us with fire. We're going to talk about that next week. And then we say to the world and everyone around us, this thing happened and this is a symbol of how important that thing is. It's changed my life forever. And by, by passing through the water, I want to tell you how you can have the same changes in your life. See, someone said that, that it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that saves you. Baptism in water, well, that just gets you wet. But we're commanded to do that, to tell everyone about the change that's happened. So passing through the water is an important theme. And here it says uh, when we pass through the water, it's a sign that the old is dead and that we are a new creation. It's a sign to everyone. See here, when they, they passed through the water, when they left Egypt, they passed through the water. The slaves are no longer. Now they are the children of Israel. And when they're, they're, the slaves are dead and the Israelites are a new creation. And when they stand at the promised land here at the Jordan River, the, the wanderers are dead. And now the nation of God's children are the new creation as they come into this new home that's been promised to their parents and grandparents. The Bible, I want to make sure I emphasize this, the Bible doesn't say that water baptism saves you. The Holy Spirit, that baptism saves you. And the, the water baptism is a memorial. 
It's a testimony. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a stone. You're going to see that. And you, those of you who've read the story know. It's a stone in your life to say, this is important. And it is commanded. Okay, back to Joshua. So they find themselves at this Jordan River, and he's got to get them across. So Joshua tells the people, you know that, that God anointed me to succeed Moses. And they said, yeah, we, we all know that. And he speaks to that in Joshua chapter 1. And so, and, and read that today if you haven't read that, or it's been a while since you've read it. Go back and look at that. And uh, he, he gives them instructions. Joshua does. He says, now's the time. God gives Joshua instructions. Let me make sure I'm communicating appropriately. God gives Joshua the instructions, and he says, now's the time. Take the people uh, into the promised land, but he says, you can't be afraid. In, in chapter 1, he says, be of good courage. Be strong. Fearless. Do not be filled with fear. And, and uh, he commands, Joshua commands the people to do that. And they follow him. The people said, we'll follow you just like we followed Moses. But the Spirit of God has, has got to be on your life. And you have got to be of good courage. So the people echo what God has said to him, and they set out, and the next day, uh, uh, God comes to, them, to him, and they move forward. Joshua 1 says, tomorrow, tomorrow you take the people into the promised land. So he goes to the people, and he instructs them, and, and now they're standing there, still looking across the river, saying, that's where we need to be, but we've got to get through this. So get that picture. It's a mile wide. It's raging water. Two million men, women, and children, and wagons, and livestock, and all of their stuff. And he's got to get them across. So look at chapter 3, verse 9. I want to tell you exactly what happened. Let you read exactly what happened. Chapter 3, verse 9 says, Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, uh, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, Jebusites, Termites, Cellulites, you know, all, all those other things. So, yeah, okay, you're a tough crowd. In, in the words of Steve Sorensen, you've you got you to gotta give more to get better jokes. And, you know, at least he said that to me. I don't know if he... Okay, verse 11. Uh, he says, See the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth. I love that. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth. That pretty much you know, says, this is it. There's no wiggle room there. The, the ark will go into the Jordan ahead of you. So what he simply tells them is that the ark is going to go ahead, uh, and the ark contains the Ten Commandments, the, uh, the Aaron's budded rod, and uh, a gold pot with some manna in it. And it's going to go ahead of them. Verse 12, Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tri tribe. Does that sound familiar? Did the same thing 40 years ago, didn't they? As soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So he says, now that as soon as the priests come down and, and the first one's foot hits the water, it's going to stop. It, you're going to see the Jordan get cut off. And it's, it says that the water is actually going to pile up. It's going to stack up upstream. And it says later that downstream is going to do the same thing. It's like all the water just stops moving above and below. That's so there's no flooding. I want you to understand. It's not going to flood upstream. And it's not going to dry up downstream. It just kind of stops above and below. It's a very, very practical miracle. God doesn't want to flood anything. He's just making a way for His children to get across. Uh, let me see. Verse 16. The, the, or 15, sorry. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a, in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of Araba, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. 
the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Isn't that great? They, they passed by on dry ground. I, that to me is very practical. It's a very practical uh, a miracle that God, it's kind of a mini miracle within the miracle that He he supernaturally dried the ground. You know, some of you are saying, well, duh, Pastor, because you can't get wagons and two million people across on the mud and all that stuff. Uh, but I, was, I didn't realize that before. I didn't read that before. He dried the ground too. So, so they didn't get all muddy and get their cattle stuck in the things and have to do a John Wayne and, you know, pull the wagon out. He would do it by hand, but they would have to, you know, do something else. It's very practical. My point is that God takes care of all the details in our lives uh, and in the life of the nation of Israel on, on Joshua's behalf. Did you also notice that the priests stopped in the middle of the Jordan River? So they stopped in the center on dry ground and as the people passed by. I looked at that too and said the gap, did some research on that, the gap between the water piling up and downstream where it piled up experts, smart people who look at those things, um, said that gap had to be about three miles wide. Why? Because Scripture tells us that they're going, God told them they're going to camp on the other side of the Jordan River that night. Well, in order to get two million people and all that stuff across the Jordan in one day, they would have to have a three mile wide gap to get everyone across in that time. That's you know, and they've got two million people. You know, that's like three times the size of our city. Okay, so I, I took liberties and says we have 333,000 people because the math is easier for me. I'm not one of those smart people that figures out all that stuff. Someone else can, can do that for me. Okay, so and you get the math, right? 333 times 3 is 999. That's just short of 1 million. And then you double that to six. So it's six times the size of Corpus Christi. And those people are all walking across the Jordan River on dry ground. And plus all their belongings. So imagine moving that image. The image of moving that many people. The three, six times the size of Corpus Christi. And as I think about that, I consider, I, I consider getting two million people and livestock and stuff all moving in the same direction and doing it in one day, that's another. That's maybe a third miracle. You know, children and mother-in-laws and cattle and, you know, wagons. And, and it's not a minor miracle either. Not because of the mother-in-laws, just because it's a lot of people. She's not here and, and she doesn't have her internet on, so she's not watching this either. Uh, now let's get back to chapter. Now we're in chapter 4. Now when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from out here in the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. They're going to stay in a, in a city called Gilgal, and, and we'll see that. Uh, later. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder. So these aren't pretty little river stones like Sharon wants to put in our yard. These are big stones that they carry on their shoulders and they're walking them up to Gilgal according to the, uh, uh, according to the numbers of the tribes of the son of Israel. Now here it is. Verse 6. Let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. Thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, just as the Lord spoke to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. And they carried them over with them to the lodging place and put them down there. Then Joshua, in verse 9, set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan. 
at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they are there till this day. So you saw what happened, right? They take up the stones and they go up to Gilgal and, and they stack them. They pile them up there. But Joshua also had the idea of taking an additional 12 stones and stacking them in the middle of the Jordan River. So when their children come and ask them, ask their parents, what are these about? What is this all about? They can tell them exactly the story. They can teach them that story. Then the, the word says, then you teach your children that God split the Jordan River and brought us over on dry ground into the promised land. Church, that's, that's important. For you and I as, as parents, as grandparents, as spiritual parents, believers, to make sure that the things that God has done in our lives, that we, we have stones for, we set up memorials. And, and we memorialize them and teach them, keep them alive for our children and our grandchildren and those that come after us. It's important, and I think it's important in the life of our church as well. It's important that we as Christians stack some stones in our lives that we remember the great things that God has done uh, for each one of us. And as we speak them to our children and to everyone that are, that are around us, everyone that will listen, that we teach them, that we uh, explain those things to them. And in Deuteronomy 6, God instructs the people of Israel to teach our children and our children's children. It says this, when we rise up in the morning, when we sit down at lunch, when we sit down di at dinner and before we go to bed uh, at night, the, the word teach there is a very interesting word in the original Hebrew. It, it literally means to pound them in now it's not you know like you're all thinking pound them in uh, you can do it in a non-physical way but some of us when we were in school we needed it to be pounded in i still don't like math um, uh, you can pound something in to somebody over time just reinforcing it over and over and over again repeating it how many of you have stories in your family that have been passed down from generation to generation. And you don't have to write them down because you know them. They've been pounded in. Living it. Explaining it. Showing it over and over again. My prayer is that each one of us have some stones in our lives that God has placed there. Of the things that God has done in our lives that need to be kept alive. To keep in memory by sharing them with your kids and your family and your loved ones and your friends. What might some of those things be? My kids know my salvation story. They know that on a Saturday afternoon in a gymnasium in St. Louis, uh, because my mother-in-law was making me teach the teen Sunday school class the next day, I was reading this simple Sunday school lesson. And it, it rang true with me. I said, I believe this, but I've got to do something about what I believe. And I accepted Christ in that gymnasium on a Sunday afternoon, sitting on the floor with my trumpet on one side and a Sunday school book on the other. And I placed a stone there. This is a monument, a memorial to something as God has done. What else? Uh, when when Sharon and I met and she fell head over heels madly in love with me on sight and pursued me all over the country. That is a stone that's been placed. That's my story. She's, she's ignoring me completely. She's heard it before. You know, I repeat it enough. Maybe it'll become true or she'll believe it. Uh, there are others. When I got baptized in the Jordan River on a trip to Israel. That's... That's a memorial. There's, there's a stone placed there. Why? Because it was important. And it wasn't during flood time, I don't think. It was dirty, though. It was really... It was like being baptized in the Mississippi River. That's another dirty river. But those are stones in our lives. Things that have happened that matter and that we want to re remember and keep alive. Now, I know we live in a culture where that's not a real positive thing a real popular thing to have happen or to practice today. You know, there are parents that, that say, well, I don't want to make my kids, force my kids to take my faith on them. I want them to, to find their own faith. 
Mm. Can I say poppycock at church? I think, okay, yeah, that's ridiculous. Um, I've heard parents, parents have told me, my teenager is my best friend. I'm, I'm looking at them saying, well, if your teenager is your best friend, then who's parenting them? I know who's parenting them. The world is. And the world wants you to be your kid's best friend because then they can put their values on your child and teach them their values. And then you've lost your child. You've gained a best friend. Someone has to be the parent. And maybe uh, that's what's wrong in our families and in our culture. See, the world isn't going to stop forcing their values on our kids. The world wants you to be their friend. Placing stones in our lives. Communicating those things that are valuable and important and life changing. That communicates value to our children, to our grandchildren, to those that are around us. Place stones in your lives and let your kids know why you why you don't do things like you used to. Place stones in your lives and let your kids know why you don't do things like their families do. Why you don't go out to bars like you used to or smoke like you used to or swear or watch shows like you used to. Or, or why you go to church all the time. They ought to know why you listen to Christian music in your car. They ought to know uh, why you have eight different Bible translations on the shelf. They ought to know why you give your tithes and gifts and offerings every week. They ought to, they ought to have those stones stacked in your family as memorials. We do things differently, and this is why we do things differently. We need to have memorials in our homes, memorials in our lives as well. Now, we've stacked some, some rocks to testify the good things, the great things that God has done in our lives. You have them. You're thinking of them now. What God has done in our personal lives. And we also need to do this for what God is doing in our church. We have a historian. Someone volunteered. I think she volunteered. I don't think she was voluntold on this one. Uh, to be our historian and, and to kind of track what's happening in the birth of this church. So she may ask you for information and she may ask you for pictures if you've taken any pictures and uh, she may ask you for strange things. I don't know. Uh, but we're placing stones as memorials in the birth of this church so that 10 years from now, 30 years from now, the generations that have passed by after us can know how this thing happened. It's a pretty interesting story, uh, planting a church in the middle of a pandemic. You know, why in the world would any of you think that's a good thing to do? We don't have to. God does. And He's in control. But those memorials in our lives are important. This is an amazing story in Joshua. Keep it as a memorial so that when your children ask, what does this mean? You can tell them and teach them, pound it in. And it's also not too late if your children are grown as well. Tell them why you've changed. That's your memorial. Those are your stones. You can speak to the change and why you do those things now. Place those stones in your home. So, beloved, as we celebrate Memorial Day tomorrow, I hope you'll remember the story of Joshua and the memorials, the stones that he's stacked that are still standing to this day, the word says. And he stacked them for the nation of Israel uh, and, and uh, that as they've come through the water and they've claimed the promised land, they always remember the good things, the great things that God has done for them. You remember the good things, the great things that God has done for you. And we remember those that gave their lives for their friends and their family and our country tomorrow. And may we begin to place memorials in our lives that will speak to the great things God is done, has done and is doing. Now, as I thought about Memorial Day and praying, I thought, you know, I, I need to find a, a, a veteran to pray today. But I thought, no, as I started to think about it, I said, no, this is to honor them and celebrate the sacrifice. So I don't want a veteran to pray today. I've asked Roxana if she would pray. She's married to a veteran.